Hey, Rick. Here we are. There you are, and here I am. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Are you there? Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This is, you know, a large part of my disease and my life right here. <laughs> it's like there's, also, all, there's it's, a lower rack as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, you know, uh, what, 10 times that size before, right? <laughs> it, it, well, not 10 times, but I would say uh, average, it was about four times this size. Uh, <laughs> this is the downsized version. And this is, I feel like a, uh, I, I can't get rid of any of these. They, they all have some kind of, you know, I can't downsize anymore, really. I'm sorry, you know. Uh, and I, it, this is the disease part of it, too, man. Like, I'll I'll be sitting here and looking at them and going, oh, yeah, I haven't played that one in a while. I can't wait to play that one. And then I'll go, oh, yeah. But, and then I'll go, oh, but wait, wouldn't it be great if I had, <laughs> you know, one of these that was purple, you know, or whatever, you know, like a, I, 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 that's the problem is, is you keep inventing sort of new modifications of different versions. And then it's like, Oh no. But yeah. Just, <laughs> and they're of course coming out with more different kinds of stuff too. You you want to get your hands on a few, a few of the new technology and all that. Right. Yeah. Are you, are you one of those guys that has like a news feed and on your phone, you check it every day kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. me too. And of course then the, the algorithms, they they figure out who we are. So right. like, I get all the latest shit from like Guitar World and Guitar Magazine and Guitar <laughs> This and Guitar That. And so yeah, every day there'll be something like, hey, there's a new deal on a new Fender. I go, ooh, right. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm doomed. Like the yep. world is coming after me. Oh yeah, it's gotten figured out and it's coming after. Me. <laughs> well, I'm a photographer, so I get everything from you know the Nikon, the Canon, all the ads, you know, all yeah, the yeah, latest yeah. technology and the news items. So you know, I mean, it's 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 tough. It's tough. It, you know, I see is. that credit card build. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, I don't even watch the credit card build. I just let my wife pay. It. There you go. I just let her handle the finances, and I go. I don't know. You know, just tell us. If we're, tell me if we're going bankrupt. Other than that, I'm just going to keep free spending like a liberal government. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, what she think of the, the the big guitar room? Is she is she glad that a lot of them are gone now? Uh yeah. Well, and she also likes it that I'm self contained of it. Yeah, yeah, it's like, not everywhere. I, they're, yeah, they're not all over the house, you know. Uh, <laughs> one of the stories that I love to tell uh, about visiting Chet Atkins in Nashville was when we took the elevator up to his office, which was the top floor of the building. And when we stepped off, there was a guitar in every corner. Like as you <laughs> went through the, you know, the lobby area, there were guitars in every corner and guitars on the wall. And then you go into the office where the secretary is and there's guitars. Uh, and then you go into his office and yeah, there's guitars. <laughs> So at any given point, if he goes, hmm, I got an idea, he could just reach over. And right. grab. Yeah. So I, I I would have liked to have had my own house like that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Now it's all, it's all confined to this space. So, <laughs> But I, I noticed your disease. You've got all of these uh, yeah. like, uh, have vinyl albums and all uh, kinds of stuff. Yeah. I have to have music in my life, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and that's the great, you know, that's why I'm such a big, rick emmett fan too is uh you know it's you gave me rock and roll when i was young um and since that time you've given me you know trifecta and you know you've given me <laughs> jazz and you've given me all kinds of great stuff to listen to and and that's you know i'm i'm, a, I'm diverse in my musical tastes so you know, it's 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 good to venture out and explore, and you do that. Uh, You're talking my language, my friend. Yes, yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah, and it's great. It's so great uh, because we still get your style, uh, but we get it in different genres, and and you know, I mean, that's that's invaluable. It really is is it's so great. Uh, Thank so, you. And so like great. now, has your taste broadened to the point where you have classical music as well? Uh, a little bit. Yeah, not yeah. much. Not much. Yeah, uh, well, the, the older I get, the more I'm sort of classical and jazz. And like, like last yesterday afternoon, I was you know NFL football on the TV. But then uh, I go, hmm. and then I'm listening to some Brahms, and I'm going, oh yeah, perhaps the most romantic of all the romantic composers. 
Like, it's just, I, I really love that stuff. You know, I really have a, a soft spot inside me for yeah. classical music, the older I get, you know. Um, however, you know, all that being said, you know, I mean, I'm still a rocker at heart, but, you know, um, yeah, and, and more and more jazz. I'm working on a project now, which is all, it's all sort of jazzy R&B guitar pieces, you know, all yeah. of them, but instrumental, all on electric telecaster. And um, so it, it's kind of all consuming for me creatively. Right. Uh, but, um, and so I'm, I'm listening to a fair bit of that too. You know what I uh, rediscovered recently too was uh, Joni Mitchell's Hajira album. Okay. Oh, man, what a record that is, you know. The guitar sounds on that are so great. And Larry Carlton, I uh, think that was one of the albums that made mm. him sort of become like, I think he was already sort of a Steely Danish kind of guy. Everybody right. knew him because of that. But uh, that album in particular, man, he just plays some. They're like, uh, um, they're like landscapes. You know, he came up with stuff where it's He's just this. Yeah, it's this texture stuff. And so, uh, you know, with my engineer, I was going, look, can, can we can we get into that territory? He goes, oh, yeah, we can do that. I go, all right, good, good, because that's what I'm going to go back all the way. And I can't remember what year that would have been, 78, 70, no, maybe even earlier, 73? Is it? Okay. I, I thought it was, know. yeah, I thought it was a little later. Yeah, I don't. No, I think it was, no? I think it was maybe okay. either early 70s, mid 70s. Like, Joni was so um, ahead of the curve yeah. in so many ways you know yeah. uh and as a songwriter too she was just in you know she's unreal so anyways okay yeah, yeah. you yeah, must yeah, have yeah. some questions for me but I, I, I do i have a few <laughs> <laughs> okay i'm sorry uh, uh, oh no please no it's great it's great and you know i have all of this because i love to tap into all of those things, you know, uh, get, like, like you said, you know, you watch the violent game of football, uh, like I do. And then you go and you listen to that romantic classical stuff. Uh, it's it, tapping that emotion. It's what it's all about. Uh, Damn it. I love that. You know, I love to be in touch with all of my feelies, you know? Uh, <laughs> so I get it for sure. Uh, you know, I was going to give you an introduction, but you need no introduction. Uh, no, that's right. We should just <laughs> absolutely just conversation is more is more fun than all that blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Rick Emmett. Blah 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 blah. The Hall of Fame, blah, 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 and, blah, and, you know the awards, the accolades, the fifteen yeah. million Who plus cares? records. Yeah, blah blah you know. blah. Well, whatever. Uh, Let's everybody, just get to it. Yeah, we we all know that. Uh, you know, and you were in some band. I forget you know something yeah everybody knows what band it is right uh, <laughs> so but you know the the beautiful thing and let, let's show the book um lay it on the line uh rick emmett in 300 pages uh that's 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 pretty good you know it's every second of every day in 300 pages not bad uh <laughs> yeah I, I wasn't sure that i could fit it all into that and b believe me when i started like the first uh, sort of iteration of, of what I was trying to do here. I took emails that I'd written to my uh, sort of and blogging kinds of things that I'd done on my, on my fan forum, on my website. Okay. And when my web person, uh, Adrian Duncan put that together for me, it was over 5,000 pages. single wow. space. Oh yeah. Be, you know, because I, I'm, I'm never really at a loss for uh, articulating myself in one way or another, you know, Great. Verbal diarrhea, you know. Um, <laughs> so self-editing became the hard part and cutting it down to like, as you say, 300 pages. But in fact, there's, you know, there's like, I don't know, 20 odd pages of pictures. Right. So there's actually 285, you know, 280 you know, odd pages of, of text, you know. So um, that was the hard part was, was, was cutting it down and, and covering all the things that I wanted to cover. You know, I think an instrumental kind of thing that needs mention is that there's 16 chapters and, you know, there are chapters that are subdivided along fairly Rick Emmett kinds of lines. There's one on guitar, there's one on yes. songwriting, there's, you know, uh, so there's stuff that relates to what it was like to be a, a teacher at a, at a college level um, right. family and, and, and you know, all these things that are mostly important to me. The Triumph chapter, which is obviously the thing that, you know, if people pick up the book, it's probably because it says Triumph. There's a word in gold lettering on the cover. <laughs> <says Triumph. laughs> and they, 
Yeah, they know that I'm the lay it on the line song guy. And so they go, oh, lay it on the line. That's the title of the book. You know, the marketing department of ECW right. Press was, you know, they were right in on those discussions. I'm going, how about we call it this? They go, well, Rick, that's a little eclectic. Uh, how about we call it lay it on the line? That's a really good <laughs> Yeah. Okay. You know. Well, I, you know, I, reading it, I thought "Ordinary Man" was perfect. I mean, it that's yeah. really the the defining that defines Rick Emmett. Uh, well, after I read the book, I'm done. I'll turn the you know put back cover over, and I say he's an ordinary man. You know, and that's that just it, the song, the 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 words itself uh, is Rick Emmett. Uh, yeah. You know, it really is. Yeah. But it's I, not I, like I catchy. Felt like- <laughs> yeah the, sorry what did you say it's not as catchy as lay it on the line it's not gonna grab grab no <laughs> no no that's exactly right yeah and and the the thing too is that um you know uh when because you're writing a a, a memoir and i call it a memoir more than a, a, an autobiography because there is autobiography in it for sure uh and there's biographical information it's more like what do I remember about my my whole life? You know those kinds of things. But the, what you meant, the ordinary man thing, I think it relates to the fact. And this is what writing a memoir kind of teaches you about yourself. For for me, anyways, it taught me that modesty and humility is a really important virtue to me. Runs through my all of my life. You know all of the things that happened to me in the life. That it's one of the things that I keep returning to because. You know, yeah, rock star, you can call yourself that. You can believe that you are. And, you know, there's uh, I can lay claim to the, the, the phrase, you know, like enough happened sure. in my life that, you know, I'm not going to deny it or disown it. But ordinary man fits me better because there is that thing of, of humility and modesty that I kind of go, look, just because you have gifts, uh, those gifts don't really matter much unless you use them in the right way and let, you know, you apply them in the right way, you know, and everybody has that to some degree. So then it becomes a question of application more than, you know, strutting around like a peacock going, yeah, you know, that's me. Like, like look at how gifted I am. Like, like that's to me, that's not the way it works, you know? So anyways, that, that was one of the things that the book taught me. I went, Oh, I guess I better make sure this is, this is in there somewhere. <laughs> But you, you know, and and you mentioned modesty, and and you know, I hear it in the book, and I hear it in the documentary. Um, Triumph is Gilmore's band, uh, you know, and that's a that is a non ego thing. You are very comfortable with that. Um, you guys each knew your role. Uh, you go over that many times. Um, you know, everybody had a function in the band, and it really, really just worked. And you're three really sweet people that just you know it's a brotherhood and you made it all work there was no yeah. thing going on that's rare that's rare yeah you know I, I mean obviously i think the the triumph chapter what i also what i made clear there is that you know we started out with this three musketeers ethos and it really did work for us uh it was the ingredient uh that uh, made me really really happy to be in that band and working with those guys you know Mm -hmm. uh and in the end you know that was the thing that kind of came apart and then it wasn't there for me anymore you know uh right uh so so that 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 was a big part of it but um you know when i was a kid uh i i you know part of my gifts that i was given you know rick is making air quotes um (laughs) gifts uh, i i had this sort of physical ability to play sports i was i was pretty good at you know catching a ball throwing a ball i was a very fast runner i had quick reflexes and stuff uh and so uh, really early on like literally probably grade three or four like for my age group i would win the school races and then i would go to the school district things and i would win those races and so track was a thing that i was involved in because I was a really quick sprinter. So, uh, and I did that all of my young life, but I was also playing baseball and I was good at that. And I really liked team sports way more than I liked individual sports. Individual sports felt like too much pressure, you know, too much anxiety and stress. And like, there's only, if you don't do it well, there's only one person to play. <laughs> right. Whereas, yeah, if you're on a team, you know, you're kind of everybody's shouldering a certain amount of the 
you're sharing in the glory. You're also sharing in the, you know, the agony of defeat. Right. You know, to, to quote ABC. But um, <laughs> and I think you know when you're in a band, there's those dynamics are there too, right? You're yeah. The, you're sharing in the. It's like that whole sort of you know army foxhole trench kind of thing, man. If right. you know if, if if you've been there and shared that, then there's a brotherhood that happens. Just because you've been there under enemy fire, you know, you, yeah. you know what it feels like. And you've shared that, you know, you've got each other's backs, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I wanted to make sure that the book conveyed some of that, mo even more of that than, well, this is why we broke up and why I hated their guts. for uh, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> that kind of stuff, like, OK, you know, get over yourself and get over the, that anger and, and, and resentment and don't make the book be about that stuff. Yes, yeah. you you got to deal with it. You got to talk about it. It's got to be dealt with. It's got to be in there. But like I was over at the Metalwork Studio a couple of weeks back and doing a thing uh, with, and Gil was there, and we walked out into the parking lot together, and we we're standing there talking. And he said, "You know, I'm not a big reader." He says, "But my, I got my daughter to be reading it, and then whenever my name shows up, I get her to read me the parts." <laughs> and I said, "Oh yeah," and he goes, "You know, Rick, you, you were too kind. You're too generous. You're you're too nice." And I go. No, I'm not. No, no, you know, I I wanted to make sure that if for legacy purposes, I was trying to be fair, but air on the side of what was the good parts of what we did, not necessarily the bad. The bad's got to be there. I know people oh, buy yeah. these things because they want to read, you know, uh, they go, all right, let's see what kind of really dirty laundry's in here. You know? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, not not for you. No, I don't. I don't think that's a well. Triumph is always was always a positive thing. Even your songwriting, uh, yes. uplifting, positive. There was a positivity to it. And you know, you, yeah, you did the rock star thing, and you had some hair in the eighties, maybe that kind of thing. You know, and it, but you guys never really played into that. It was a t-shirt and jeans kind of w let the music do the talking band, uh, and it did that. You know, so yeah. we, I think as fans, anybody who knows Triumph and has listened to the music over the years knows that there's a positivity. Uh, we, we expect yeah. positivity. We don't expect the the negativity that might have happened. Uh, you know, so, and, and that's what we get. You know, even yeah. the negative parts, you're kind about it. Yes, and, and um. Uh, when I, you know, I had beta readers, like folks to 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 take a look at it before, you know, it was going to go right. even to my editors, you know, uh, and especially the Triumph chapter, you know, I, I wanted to have some folks look at it and um, they, they would get, you know, they would get back to me and say exactly what you just said, you know, come on, you know, the, mm -hmm. you're supposed to be like, don't dwell on, on this stuff. Uh, that's going to not be a reflection of what you know your life you know the, the the whole perspective of your life offers so you know you might want to revise this sentence here you might want to lose this paragraph here you know and sure. uh, you know i think this is a sort of a life lesson for everybody that you know we all have things that happen in our lives where you know we lose family members and we're grieving or you know something really bad and heavy and shitty comes to, at, at work and, and you're carrying around anger and resentment and or you know you're looking at your neighbor and thinking man i have envy for you know all of those kinds of you know vices kinds of stuff right. you know and um i do think it's really important in your life to go okay but i gotta get over this i i gotta get past this you know uh i can't dwell and and remain in these places that are the negative places you know, there's, a, I think, a, a lyric, a J Don Henley wrote a song like, uh, man, you, you got to let that go. It, it'll eat you up inside, you know. Yeah. Uh, the heart of the matter, I think, is, is it's a fantastic yeah. song, you know. It really, yeah. really a great, great lyric. Like a classic song for all time, you know. Yeah. And Henley had that ability to come up with those kinds of things where, you know, it just sounds like conversation. Like you're sitting with your best friend and he goes, man, you got to let that go. That'll, that'll just eat you up inside. And you go, oh, Don, 
I wish you were my. I wish you were my pal. You know, I wish we could sit and have coffee together, and you know, and I could hear you tell some of those stories. Because I mean, obviously, think about my memoir versus his life, and you right. kind of go, "I was not on the same scale as that guy," you know. <laughs> and he arrived at that, so you know, I think I should arrive at those kinds of things too. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's it's a beautiful thing, and and you know, one thing too that from the book. You know, you're Rick Emmett of Triumph. Uh, that's how a lot of people know you. Um, that's fair. But, you know, it's 30 pages of that 300-page book is the Triumph chapter. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. That's 10%. Uh, that, and, and, you know, that seems pretty accurate. Yeah, that's why we're here. Uh, that's what opens the doors, the catalyst for all of it. Uh, but Exactly. There is so much in the book uh, with family and, you know, the solo stuff and, you know, the meeting of people and just, you know, all, you know, the teaching. Uh, there's so much. It's that Rick Emmett guy is a pretty complex character, isn't he? He's not just the singer and the guitar player for Triumph. Yeah, it isn't this interesting? You know, three or four <laughs> questions ago, you were saying ordinary man, ordinary man. And now you're saying, oh, complex. And I think that's the human experience. We're all like yeah. that. You know, we, we all have this range of stuff, you know, from happy to sad, from, from you know, joy and celebration to tragedy, you know, from being complex creatures, you know, to being, you know, run by our reptile brains <laughs> you know like when i think that is ordinary like yeah like you say yeah we we're yeah. all kind of that uh yeah. we simplify the rock star i think you know you're the guy with the guitar on the stage that makes me happy you know you yeah. sing to me and that's you know that's who you are you know 100 percent of the time <laughs> you know yeah you don't have the tragedy and the the emotion and all of that. Only only the guitar and the songs and you know that's it's simple. Yeah, although you know, I'll say this. You know, um, one of the things that I was so grateful for in the band Triumph was that Mike and Gil would give me like they would go, "Here's your rope, go and hang yourself." You know, <laughs> and like a song like Suitcase Blues would be on the Just a Game album, and it was about the loneliness of being a musician on the road, and it was about. Yeah. You know, it was about jazz chord changes, you know, and yeah. people, some reviewers would go, what the hell is this doing on a rock <laughs> record? You know, like the album after uh, Just a Game, I think it was Progressions of Power, and it had the song Take My Heart on it. And yeah. so it was kind of like, and the guys were saying, yeah, Rick, we're going to let you have your moments. You can have your classical guitar piece moments, you know? And I think, like, uh, Mike Levine was a big proponent of, no, no, we want to have that because we're an album band and these are the things that album artists do. You you do use your B cuts and your C cuts to, to go off on tangents and, and do different things. And I love that about the band. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. the music business was changing by the mid 80s and that was getting bled right out of it. You know, the, the albums that were selling a lot, you know, your Def Leppard records and Brian Adams and Hart and, right. you know, there was there was stuff that was just going you know journey and stuff. They were selling like seven times platinum and stuff. And so then all the other labels are also going. Well, we want an artist like that. We that's what we want to have in terms of sales, and that really did start to be driving the, you know, the thing that was in the the uh, in the industry from before had been. Pink Floyd and Led, right. Ze Led Zeppelin, and and it was it was very much an album art kind of thing, mm -hmm. and that was starting to get bled right out of it, and uh, you know I was losing interest. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and it, it is is it's a different kind of artist, uh, yeah. and you know, I mean, you're that exploratory artist. You know, you want to do a few different things. You want to, you know. You want to mess with things a little bit and be a little bit different. Uh, you know, not write the same pop song 10 times. Um, That's exactly. It. You know, and not that there's anything wrong with that. You know, um, no. it's just a different kind of what you want to do. And uh, yeah, that's, and now we have a singles world, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's rare to see somebody put out a, a whole full length album anymore. Uh, you get two or three at a time, one, uh, you know, here and I there. Know. 
It, it, and it's a weird thing too. It's like you know the 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 wheel of fashion, right? The circle comes back around. When I was a kid, you 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 got your uh, uh, allowance and you went down to the local. It, where I lived, it was a department store, and you would buy it. Yeah, you'd buy a single. And yeah. you know, I, my like my brother was kind of better with money than I was. He would get to buy two or three. You know, I would only ever have enough money left over to buy <laughs> to buy one or to just borrow the one that the kid across the street bought. You know. Um, <laughs> But yeah, but everybody had their their little box that had all of their singles in it. You, you right. know, the, there'd be a party, and you and people would bring their boxes. Yep. You know, and and there'd be a little Sea Breeze record player, and it, everybody'd be playing forty fives. So that was the world, and it was driven by AM radio. Along came yeah. FM radio; it changed that thing. And I, you know, in my memoir, I do want to track. You know, I I wanted to make sure that that story was being told too. That the that technology drives the music business more than anything else you know we think yeah. oh no this is happening organically and you go no it's not no. sony is sitting around their boardroom table figuring out yeah you know we could put four hours of music on a cd but let's not right <laughs> right <laughs> because they're deciding how they're gonna you know have delivery formats mm -hmm. and so i you know and the internet is coming and they know it you know they're just waiting for it to be aligned so that when they finally do it you know, they're going to be the company that's manufacturing the little tiny chips yeah. that are inside everybody's phone because that's where the money's going to be. You know, like right. the, the money's no longer going to be in music publishing. You know, that's just going to be, you know, this thing that's a, a very small feeder of all the rest of the stuff that goes on. You know, so I wanted to make sure I told that story, too, because that was my perspective. And I had been, you know, uh, a cog in the machine <laughs> of that. <laughs> Never mind being the cog in rock and roll machine, which I was that too. So, like you know, there's stories within stories within stories, mm -hmm. which you know, goes back to this thing that you said about uh, you know complexity. Like there is complexity out there. You know, it's just how much do you want to be aware of it and have it guide what you do, and how much do you want to just go, nope, nope, turtle, <laughs> turtle, pull right, myself right. back into my shell. <laughs> well yeah and we and again we don't think of you know the rock star dealing with that stuff you just have fun and go out and play you know it's 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 very simple <laughs> you know yeah. you know we don't think about all of the complexity within the business side of it uh you know and and the beautiful thing that we all know as fans of triumph is you know we knew who took care of the business end who took care of you know the more musical end you know everybody had a role and was extremely happy within their role it seems you know what i mean uh you know gil loves running metalworks i know it you know talked to gil before he is you know he was at the studio when i talked to him he was thrilled to death to be there uh you know he just it's his world and he yeah. loved being in it and handling all of those things and the business end of it and uh you know mike does his thing and you you know go to a room and write music uh it, it, it all worked and that is so it's man you know you don't see that too often ever really i, I you know the, the triumph was very unique in that way yeah thank you I mean, and i was grateful for that and mm -hmm. i mean it was unique in you know other aspects of that like what you're describing is a very self-managed uh self-contained kind of thing whereas with most uh, acts music bands you know rock groups they've got uh, they got to have a manager they got to have an agent you know th th and those right. people become you know instrumental in how the band but triumph was very self-contained you know okay. gill was very much a general manager i mean the guy could do because his dad had been really good with numbers and accounting and bookkeeping and gill was really really smart about that stuff you know and uh and mike the, you know there there was no radio and pr promotion guy like a marketing radio promo kind of guy right. out there that, that that's what they did that's what their job was they weren't smarter than mike mike knew the gig like and mike would be the kind of guy that well you know we'd be driving in a car to a gig and he could be on his phone going hey jimmy and he's you know he's talking to the music director at some station in some market that we're going to play at in three weeks you know, and Mike knows the guy first name basis. 
And he's going, come on, Jimmy, you got to kick that rotation up another. We we got to you got to put us into heavy because we're going to be there in two weeks. You know? <laughs> he's a solid. I would listen to yeah. that and go, man, the guy is re- like, you know, what other bass player in a in a rock band is like that? Like nobody, you know. Yeah. So there was there was some really really great things about being, and I wanted to make sure that those things got exposed in the book too, you know. Yeah, yeah, and and it's great, and that's so great because so many artists remove themselves from that because it can be a dark area uh the business side of things you know uh, it can. and artists are you know creative types and you know just reaching to be happy with it within their art uh so to, to, to hit the business side of it within a band is is odd uh and and man you guys did it well <laughs> oh, thank you. it was just something else there, there's there's luck you know i i i want to make sure, sure that you know, and I I talk about that in the in in the in the memoir as well. That there's these things of, you know, the metaphor would be that you're on a roller coaster ride, and you know, sometimes it's 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 just going along, you know, clank 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 clank, you know, this and then whoa, you know, now something crazy's going on, you know, and right. ups and downs and ins and outs and backs and forths and all the rest, you know, um, and you do have to have this. We share this kind of. Um, sense of humor about the surreal nature of it all and that was one of the things that helped us survive as long as we did you know yeah. um but uh, you know nothing is forever despite what we might uh, imagine because of the rolling stones and hackney diamonds <laughs> you know I, I look at that and i go god that's defying you know all <laughs> aspects of reality i don't know how that's possible uh, but it's great you know? it is that that's just outstanding that that's going on and good for them you know uh, it uh like it makes me even more of a fan than i was you know right. um because i know what it's, at, at the age of 70 i know what a struggle it's becoming for me in terms of uh you know the arthritis in my hands and you know getting myself going in the morning right. like there's little keith you know he's on the jimmy fallon show and he's start me up <laughs> yeah <laughs> Now he's got a nylon string guitar, so you know he's. But I go, good for you, Keith. Like, by God, that's a real, <laughs> that's a, you know, there, there's a, there, there's a, an object lesson right there, you know. It's it's crazy, you know, and and I, you know, Sammy, uh, Sammy Hagar just had a birthday, yeah. and you know, at seventy six, uh, it, it uh, and I'm watching him do push ups backstage, you know, like 40 of them before he goes out. And the guy is just, he's a ball of energy still. It's yeah. like, what? Yeah, you know, I don't think I'm going to be alive at 76, <laughs> but he's, yeah. so he looks like he's 30, you know. It's, yeah, it's I'm, just nutty. And let's just imagine, what, you know, the tequila has done to his liver. <laughs> like, <laughs> So that guy burns the candle at both ends, and yet somehow he's like, "There's a true rock star for you. There's a guy that can bring it on 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 so many levels and remain." And there are guys like that, like Sam, the guy that sings for ACDC, Brian Johnson. Like, yeah. holy cow, the guy can still bring it. And I go, "How is that even possible? Like, <laughs> I can't even imagine singing that high anymore." He's out there giving her, and I'm going. All right, yeah. man. Like full credit, like, <laughs> and the grit too. You know, got it. It hurts to listen to. Uh, <laughs> you know that 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 rough grit. I mean, that's got to take a toll, right? But yeah, it's it's crazy. Uh, you know, with with that said, you know, you tell the story of of Marco's secret songbook, uh, which which I love. I you know, I it's it's a very different record, and again, I love the diversity that you offer. Um, one of the only concept records uh, that you did, um, the only concept record. You pitched yep. that to Steve Howe uh, from Yes, and I know you, you admire Steve. You admire Yes, his big influence on you. Um, he calls back. He's not crazy about the idea. <laughs> uh, but you know, tell me if if he called you back today and offered you. Uh, free freedom to write with him uh, on a yes record, um, and and be involved in a yes record. Uh, you, you you say the you know all the other numbers are right in the business end of it. Um, is that something that you would take on? No, no, I don't <laughs> think so. 
<laughs> but, but no, well, if 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 what he said was he wanted to do a Steve Howe Rick Emmett record, I would go, yeah, absolutely. But the the idea by you know the condition you created was you said, well, on a yes yeah. record, and I go, yeah, I don't want to do that. And part of that is because when you do that, there's a brand thing that now starts to get. It's this really big, heavy thingy. And S Steve is very comfortable in that. I think he's really, the, you know, a guy that's still, you know, working that. That's his thing. Yes, his, it wasn't originally. I think originally it was kind of Squire and Anderson. Mm -hmm. And then Squire and Anderson kind of had a falling out. And then it was just Squire. And he was hiring guys and putting bands together and, and going out on tour. And it was called Yes. But then, and Steve Howe was out of it. He was, you know, being in Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman, you know, blah, blah, blah. It, there, there were other things that were going on and the brand name wasn't necessarily. But then, oh, he came back in and, and, and the, you know, and Squire passes away. And, the, and I, I saw a little clip online, John Anderson being interviewed and somebody said, so, you know, blah, 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 blah. Would you go back into yes? And, and Anderson was going, nope, I don't want to yeah. do it. You know, it's that's not me anymore. You know, um, I would avoid it. So and. In the book, I talk about the fact that I got other offers back in the 90s. You know, and did I want to be in uh, Asia? Did I, yeah. yeah. And, and Damn, you know, Damn Yankees when they were starting up. Yeah. And these were only exploratory conversations, you know, offers that were kind of like, hey, what do you think? Would you be interested in this? And in the end, I would say in the end, no, I, I'm not. You know, um, if Tom Schultz said to me, hey, Rick, I'm thinking about doing a Schultz Emmett kind of. My name has to come first, but I'd like to do it. <laughs> and I would go, yeah, you know, I would definitely consider it, um, but I would want it to be like an equal partner, equal say, equal, which was, that was the trifecta thing, which you said you liked that record, right? right? Yeah. Um, like in that, in that project, it was going to be all three guys, equal say, equal kind of creativity. And it was sort of laid out, no, it's going to be just instrumental music and, that was kind of like the, the the formula to go into it. And I went, I'm in, you know, I, I, I like mm -hmm. the feeling of what this can be. Now, you know, after I'd done it for a year and a bit, I kind of went, okay, done it. Been there, done that. Now I want to move on. You know, I want to get right. back to my own kinds of things because I, I, I like the idea of projects, you know, like, Hey, this is a thing that you can commit yourself to for a, you know, not forever, <laughs> just for a, 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 a period of time, you know. And um, back in the day, you know, when I was a young man and you go, OK, triumph, we're, we're all in. Right. Then things that you learn from doing that where you go, yeah, I don't think I'll ever do that again. I don't <laughs> think I'll ever take on partnerships that are constructed in that way. Uh, I don't think I would ever want to be art by democracy kind of, of situation, you know. Um, although, you know, uh, collaborating is, um, it, it, it's not something that I um, seek out on an ongoing basis in my life. You know, uh, I would rather just be creative on my own. You know, uh, that would be my choice, you know. But if a collaboration came along and, and it seemed like it had, you um, a kind of uh, common sense in the way that it was being formulated. I would play. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. That that that, that you know, you're Rick Emmer, the retired rock star. Uh, it's but maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. And you are working on uh, you know stuff right now, which is which is great to hear. You know, jazz yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that. And that creativity never goes away. You know, that was another important thing yeah. in the book that really I'm about creativity, you know? Yeah. And so if, whenever the business is starting to get in the way of that, or whenever, you know, I, I mean, even now when arthritis is trying to get in the way, you know, I go, no, no, I'm going to try to figure out a way around it because creativity is really the most important thing to me of all, you know? Um, and I think it keeps certain parts of me, alive and young and uh fresh and invigorated and and uh, all of those kinds of things you know so um yeah. 
I don't get on my elliptical, which is over in that corner back over there. <laughs> which I, you the know, one the that big hangs, hang clothes on, you know, that one. Yeah, the no, no, hanger. I, <laughs> no I, I get on it. And the reason I get on it is because creativity is saying to me, hey, you got, if you want to stay vital, you're going to need to do these things for your body, your whole body. You, you need to do right. this, you know. And when the doctor says, you know, you might want to cut out some carbs there, Rick. You know, <laughs> okay, I will because what I want is to remain creative. You know, that's the most important thing to me of all. You know, so I'll do whatever it takes. You know, when the doctor says, "Yeah, I'm sorry, man, you're going to need to take some prednisone for a while," and that means you can't have any booze, and I go, "No booze." What? Oh. <laughs> and then I go, well, if this is what I need to do in order to get, you know, attack this rheumatoid arthritis thing that's threatening, you know, then, OK, I, I'll I'll do that because these guys are more important to me than anything else. You know, yeah. right. The, these things at, at the age of 70, these things remain passports to the universe, you know, for me. And yeah. I want to go there, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that's, you know, that is, it's much the same with, with my background. Uh, yeah. you know, I, I put this on, I go somewhere else. I, yeah. I cannot imagine life without the triumph catalog, uh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, oh my God, you know, there's, uh, it really, it, it's, it changed my world. It's so listen. many millions of people. You know. I'm going to give you a, a little insight into something that's going on. I'm going to go to Sweden for New Year's, and I'm going to play in a cover band uh, that entertains the folks that go to the uh, World Junior Hockey Championships every three or four years or whenever they happen. But this year yeah. it's in Gothenburg, Sweden, and I'm going with my wife. But one of the reasons I'm going is because they talked me into it by saying, hey, you know, we'll do some Triumph songs, but Rick, We'll do them in any key you want. We'll do any arrangement you want. We'd like to provide you with a string quartet and some horn players if you'd uh, like. And I, I get to do like hold on, magic power, and lay it on the line with strings and horns. And they went, yeah. And I went, okay, I'm in. And so up, yeah. magic power, which would normally be, you know, in the old key of D. And of course, you know, over the years with Dave Dunlop, I was, you know, tuning the guitar down and then changing <laughs> here and there. But and now I've moved it down to the key of A. <laughs> but in the key of A, that song you can hammer on an acoustic guitar like Pete Townsend, you know, yeah. at the secret policeman's other ball when he did like pinball, <laughs> with, you know, like you can just beat the crap out of the guitar. <laughs> and I'm going with strings and horns. This is going to be so much fun. So yeah. the Triumph catalog for me remains vital and alive, and because I can reinvent the songs right. in new ways, and so. I don't know if they'll make it to recordings or not, but I'm hoping that maybe there'll be some YouTube clips that come out of it. So yeah. that looks like you will be able to hear the songs in a new way. Yeah. yeah, that's just awesome. That's, you know, and that's really, I mean, that's the excitement of, you know, f for you and f for fans, obviously. But, you know, for you, it's, you need that, you know, as an artist, you know, you get, you got to play it the same way over and 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 over some more uh now to to reinvent that and make it anew uh is is pretty special man that's you yeah, get to breathe new life into it and and you know part of it too is and i think this was a kind of the, the dumb luck thing of of you know a music career when we, when i wrote the lyrics i had a, a, an intuition about a lyric that could last that would be something that i could still sing and mean it when i was 40 years old and 50 years old and 60 years old you know and now here i am 70 but i can still commit to those lyrics they don't date themselves no. as if i was singing a thing about being a teenager with hormones or you know a 20 year old guy looking for a party like to me those songs they become much harder to you know, to, to, to yeah, rework. It's hard but to sell the, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The lyrics of those tunes, they, they still work. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. Uh, uh, I don't mean to cut this short, but I, I do got, you know, I got to give you yeah. how much time had you booked for this? Uh, nobody told me anything. So, okay. you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, you know, once yeah. we get up around the hour mark, I, okay. I've got 
I got another one that I got to get to. Okay. You, you're stacked up like a like a plane at O'Hare Airport. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you mentioned journaling um, in your hotel room after shows because you you didn't really do the after show rock star thing. Um, do you still have those journals? Oh, geez, yeah, yeah. And I've got boxes and boxes full of spiral notebooks. Like I would always, always have spiral notebooks that I was writing songs in or writing, starting little stories or journaling things or whatever. And uh, hey, look at that lab there. Hey, no, uh, it's uh, golden, golden retriever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I've got a dog that has a little bit of that. It's a golden doodle. Uh, well, that was the dog we had before. The one we've got now is a, a Aussie doodle. So it's got half Australian Shepherd instead of half golden retriever. And now I kind of wish we step stayed with the golden retriever part. Yeah, because. Yeah. Uh, they're so gentle and beautiful, and uh, they just want to make you happy, don't they? Yep. They, yep. And awesome. of course, eat anything that they can find. <laughs> of course, including their own vomit. You know. <laughs> yeah. The, but uh, anyway, so, so I'm distracted. I was talking about what? I was talking about um, the journals. Oh yeah, yeah. So, um, I still do that. I don't do it as much because, I, in fact, I don't have as much downtime alone time as i used to have when i'd be on the road or you know uh, when i was a younger man um because i mean we just had the grandkids here for <laughs> for two night two overnights you know and uh so there there are priorities you know uh absolutely but, yeah but i still yeah i still journal every day and i still and i have the box like are you driving at something here like you you'd like me to make well, the journals yeah Seriously? I mean, come on. Uh, you know, every Rick Emmett fan, Triumph fan, whatever you want to call them, um, would love to get a peek at that. Uh, yeah. Your journals from, you know, the Allied Forces tour or, you know, uh, yeah. right let after me, the show. Yeah. You know, let, me, let me tell you uh, what I think about that. Uh, and the answer is no. And the, and the reason is because, you know, uh, when, it's one thing for folks to see me up on stage and playing my stuff, right? Whole other thing to see me naked, you know, go like right. coming out of the shower. And I go, yeah, you know, I'm not necessarily sure that I'm willing to share that that part of me. And the other thing for me too is that uh, I have been a writer pretty much all of my life, from the time I was about nine or ten, you know. And I know, and I used to teach this. It's in the book. You know, one of the secrets of life is 0.367, which was the lifetime batting average of Ty Cobb, the greatest right. hitter of all time, failed more than six times out of 10. And right. I'm not the greatest hitter in the world. And I know that, you know, like I would be a guy that would be hitting 250, you know, 260 in, in the major leagues. Uh, I, I think I would be a competitor and I would learn to spray the ball around. I wouldn't be a home run hitter. You know, I, I would definitely not. So because I'm that kind of a guy, I realize, hey, man, when I write a song, the first idea that I have is only worthy of the toilet, <laughs> you know, or the garbage can. <laughs> but if I, you know, keep thinking about it and re revise it and then, oh, take this idea from over here and then put, integrate those and then, oh, and then it's building slowly but surely. And then I get and I'll go, you know, this is starting to become a good song, but it takes right. a long time. And for me, uh, uh, I would say nine to 15 drafts of a song before I'm going, okay, this lyric is now ready for music. And now, now I'm going to get to that stage or I have some lyric and some music, but now I go, mm, I'm going to need to do a demo of this, like even just into my, you know, voice memo on my phone and I'm going to do it. And then I'm going to listen back to it. And I'm going to go, yeah, okay. I'm still two months away from that turning into something that I would want the public to hear right? and judge me on, or, or not even just judge me, but just enjoy, you know, like find interesting or find to be uh, of market value, you know, like it's like the growing of a piece of fruit. Like I don't want to give them something that's not ripe, you know, like, I don't want to give them something that'll give them diarrhea. <laughs> you know I, mean? like, I 
I want it to be the, 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 you know, I want it to be fresh and I want it to be ready and ripe and all of those kinds of things. So because I put those things upon myself, you know, uh, those journals exist and they're in a box, you know, some are out in the shed, some are down in the basement, you know, and when I, I don't, I think maybe when I die, they're either going to get burned by my family or they're going to put them into a, like universities will take these things uh, so that if people wanted to do research, they can access them. But I, I swear to God, before I have my fatal disease that's going to take my life, I'm going to go through those boxes and I'm going to be ripping pages out and burning them <laughs> because there's going to be certain things I'm going to go to the grave with. You know, the, the, the things that you're talking about where somebody might go, oh, my God, this is fascinating. I want a way. Before you get a chance to to decide, I want to weigh what will be my legacy and what won't. Right. You know? And I know the, the Triumph guys have already done some things where the University of Toronto has boxes of stuff and old 24 uh, track, two inch tapes. And that's all in the U of T archives. And when Banger did their documentary, they yep. had to go to the U of T and, you know, uh, uh, sign some things out and, and, and access some things there in there. And they couldn't take it out. Because those guys had already done that as part. Because Gil is is very much into that thing about legacy, right? Yeah, I'm not there yet. You know, I haven't gotten to this. <laughs> um, this the I, I've always wondered who who's the beautiful young lady, a friend of the photographer, and I I I don't I did we didn't even know her name. I didn't know her name. You know, I mean, we were going to shoot the shot, and then here was this girl in a robe, and you know, beautiful girl, red hair and freckles and and uh, and uh, you know, and because it was a friend of the photographer, he would be able to say to her things like, "Can you just pull the robe down a little bit and show me a little bit more leg?" You know, and she was going, <laughs> "Yeah." You know, and we're just standing there going, like, "And the shot that's there on that cover, can you hold that up again?" Sure. Hold it up. That was not even a shot that um, they were. What he, when he was taking it, that it was like one of the shots. This was a shot that he shot when. A guy was talking to us from, uh, you know, off stage right there. Okay. And everybody was looking at him while he was talking. And I'm pulling my hair out from under my guitar strap. Right. That's what's, it was a completely, you know. Not we, ready I, for we did, it. We did pose some shots where Gil was on the phone and talk about a manager, right? The You're right. Man. <laughs> there he, but at, it was like. That was a shot that was not a shot that was part of the shoot, and that's the one that got on the cover. <laughs> I love it. Uh, last question for you, Rick, and I, and yeah. I not to go to a dark place, I, but I'm curious, and I think all of us are. Um, you know, Triumph goes on. Triumph is Gilmore's band, right? He goes on and gets Phil X, does Edge of Excess. Have you ever listened to it? Look, I listened to a few things when it first came out. Yeah. Okay. No, I, yeah. And I wouldn't, you know, if you want to elaborate, I, it would be wonderful. I understand that, you know, if you, if you would hold back. Uh, well, I mean, thoughts. I can talk about it. I can, you know, uh, I do think that um, what you're seeing there is, you know, it was, I don't know, 1990, 1991, 1992, somewhere in there, you know, uh, at 89, 90, 91, maybe that's when this was going down with him and, uh, and, and, and Mike, and they're trying to sort of reinvent what triumph would be without Rick. So I think what you're kind of getting a, lo a look of is what would triumph have been if it had, had a different guitar player and it had been more Gill's band. And I think if you go back, one of the big albums in Triumph's career was the second album we made in Canada. It was called Rock and Roll Machine. And then we were able to make the deal in the States. And then they took that album that you held up was the first right. album. And they combined the first two to make the first U.S. release. But it was Rock and Roll Machine. Now, Rock and Roll Machine was a, a song that Gil wrote, but he wrote it about me. He wrote it about his idea of what Rick Emmett was going to be in the band, which was kind of like a Johnny B. Goodish kind of thing. Like, here's the rock and roll machine. It's the rocket. Well, watch the rocket play. You know, you yeah. get his stuff when the rocket's played. Like, it was a very Chuck <laughs> Berry-ish kind of lyric, you know. And I was more than happy to animate that version of how Gil saw me and saw the band. And so that album was very much a Gilmore kind of album. 
rock and roll machine. You know, this is what triumph is. You know, even later when the documentary comes out, like decades later, the, the documentary is going to be called Rock and Roll Machine. You know, and you go, OK, so that I think the, the Edge of Excess album with Phil, I think Gil was going, we, we got to get back to this rock and roll machine thing. It's got to be this kind of thing. But by that time, I think, honestly, truthfully, unless you were going to do that and you were going to go all the way over into the metal edge of things where it was going to be you were competing with Metallica and and right. Tool and uh you know uh Megadeth and those kinds of bands and you were going to be you know real Judas Priest heavy mm -hmm. because I think that could you know but I I think in the case of Triumph you've got a brand name where uh, uh, folks like you you're coming to the band because you're going, all right, I want that positivity. I want that. Where's that? You know, where's Rick? <laughs> and at, when I met Phil at a guitar thing, you know, uh, in that time period, I shook his hand and, and I, you know, I was completely hundred percent happy, you know, said, good luck to you, man. I really hope this works out for you mm -hmm. because I know how hard it's going to be. And I didn't mean that in a, in a, yeah, I'm amazing kind of way. You're never going to be able to fill my shoes. I meant, you know, uh, I just the the triumph was partly my shoes, right? And you're going right. to fill it. And I know how hard that's going going to be. Like, you know, and I'm not saying this to be self-aggrandizing, but the truth of the matter is, find me another player on the planet that can play guitar the way I can, sing the way I can, write songs the way I can. Right. And that was part of made me me those three things yeah. made me me right they they're never going to make phil x me and right. so that the challenge he could never sing like me he could never sing as like i would be thinking who's going to sing land on the line life like right. who's going right. to be able to sell that tune you know because you can't go see triumph and not have them do that you right. Know? right so it was hard and now here's the uh, another ironic thing is mike clink has been doing a, a, a triumph tribute record for round hill you aware of this no yeah so mike clink you know the guy of you know right. guns and Roses, appetite for destruction but he was you know he had done the sport of kings record and he's rem remained friends with gill and mike and yeah so he, he's he's going around and he's making these things and this album is going to eventually come out i guess um but he was struggling. He couldn't find any singers that want that could sing the Rick Emmett songs, like singers that, that, that <laughs> wanted to do it. You know, that wanted to take it on. He was right. having a hard time. And you know, in conversation, I would say, "Well, Mike, you know, use a female vocalist." And he was going, "Yeah, it's hard to find hard to find ones that'll say yes." You know, <laughs> we were th we were thinking Ann Wilson, and she took a pass. You know, and you go, "Oh, okay." You know, so. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, blowing my own horn here. I'm just saying, you know, like it's, yeah, it's a package deal. Uh, you don't, you know, Rick Emmett's Rick Emmett for sure. You know, uh, is one of a kind for sure. Broke the mold after that yeah. one. You know? <laughs> yeah. But you know, I think that's true for anybody, you know, and, and I'm going back to this ordinary man thing again, you know, like everybody's got things that make them who they are. And, yeah. you know, one of the great joys in life is to figure out what are those things about yourself? And so what can you make your life be about those kinds of things? Because then, man, your life is going to be very rewarding and, and very fulfilling, you know. And I mean, you're sitting there and you got your dog there beside you. That's a part of who you are. Right. And yeah. I think dog owners, that's an easy one. That's why there's so many of them. <laughs> and the one Go and spend all of that money for all of that dog food and those poo bags and walk around and pick up their shit after yeah. <laughs> because that is part of what makes us who we are like i i can't get along without having a dog come right. to me in the morning and being and she nuzzles me and licks my face and yep. i get to scratch her and i'm going all right this makes my heart full yes and I, I, I need that you know so um Everybody's got that opportunity, and I just want to encourage everyone to keep doing that. Keep finding yourself, you know, keep reinventing yourself. That's that's where your happiness can be. That's yeah, such a great message, man. Uh, and, and Rick, I want to, uh, last thing, I want to thank you for somebody's out there, especially. Um, I don't know that it's my 
favorite thing you've done or even my favorite triumph song. Uh, but it came at a time in my life where I, you know, I'm not the most handsome guy, uh, you know, and I was a teen at the time and, you know, teen life is difficult and can be, you know, but hearing that song and hearing the brightness of that song kind of told me that there was somebody out there for me. And, you know, now I'm, I got two kids grown and gone and, you know, 32 years of marriage and, you know, but it's, I think it, it started there. Um, cause I had doubts that I'd, anybody would ever be with me. Uh, and hearing that song, you know, this, uh, it gave me that hope that there is somebody. Oh, so that, just that is such that. a wonderful thing. Thank you for sharing that with me. And, and, um, yeah. and saying that I, I, I can't tell you how fulfilling that is for me. Like, it's, uh, <laughs> That's it, a great, great thing for you to share with me at five after two on a, on a I'm Monday sorry. afternoon. When I've got to go to other interviews, you I, son of a bitch. <laughs> I'm going to have red eyes. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. Thank you. That was, thank you. But yes, and, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one. So uh, you've done that with so much. Um, thank thank you. you. Thank you. You're thank welcome. You. And thank you for th thanking me. And, you know, there was a line once in a, in a MASH episode where, uh, Frank, the guy, you know, the major, he was talking about um, uh, with Hot Lips Houlihan, and they were having a conversation, and, and she goes, oh, Frank, that's nice. And he goes, well, it's it's nice. And, no, you're nice. She goes, no, you're nice. He goes, well, it's 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 nice to be nice to the nice. <laughs> my wife and I say that all the time, you know. So, hey, man, it's nice to be nice yeah. to the nice. Yes, yes. I appreciate okay. it, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome. I, I hope we can do it again. Write another book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, when when ten Telecaster Tales comes out, I'll we'll, somebody will be in touch with you. All right. Fantastic. I appreciate that. I look forward okay. to it. Thanks, Rick. Bye. Take it easy. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.